Hello and welcome to Let's Talk with Lee Piet. This is episode three and this week I am joined by television legend Gloria Honeyford. I've known Gloria for a couple of years now and she is utterly lovely. She always has time for people and everyone knows she will gladly chat. So she was one of the first on my list of people to chat to. Gloria in this episode discusses the amazing people she's interviewed, including Audrey Hepburn. She talks about her upbringing and we pick just a few highlights from her massive career, um, as many as we can basically in 30 minutes. She also discusses the tragic loss of her daughter Karen uh, and how she lives on in her memory. So this is episode three. Enjoy. If you haven't already, subscribe and sit back and listen to the lovely Gloria Honeyford. So, um, welcome. I'm joined by Gloria Honeyford. Thank you, Gloria, for coming along. It's my greatest pleasure. Being Irish, I like to talk, so just far ahead. Well, I was going to say, I uh, I know you. I've known you for a couple of years now. We've been on the show together. Um, I wanted to talk to you about Ireland growing up. Uh, you were, where, were you, where were you born? Well, I come from the north of Ireland, a place called Portadown, which is right smack in the middle of Northern Ireland. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was a small market town, um, nothing to do in it except go to the movies. So we had three cinemas in our small town, and they changed their program three times a week. So we saw a lot of movies, and that was our main source of entertainment, because it's um, a Protestant town. And therefore, at that stage, going way back, of course, being the age I am, um, even the swings were tied up in the park on a Sunday. The cinemas were not open on a Sunday. And so the only thing was either to go to church or go to a place called Bassie's Ice Cream Shop, where you could get Italian ice cream on a Sunday night. And that was it. Uh, But it was a very friendly time where everybody knew everybody else. And I wrote my autobiography about a year ago. And when you go through a process like that, the one thing that I always knew, but it re-endorsed to me, is that I was always loved. And when you get older, it's a great thing to know that you were loved by your parents. Mm-hmm. You know, to have that love in your life. And so I regard myself as very lucky as we had uh, little or no money. I mean, we weren't sort of uh, short of food or shoes on your feet, but there wasn't any spare money. Um, but my dad worked hard, but uh, he would never, ever allow my mum to work. My mum had to be a stay-at-home mum, look after the kids. So it was a beautiful upbringing. What did your dad do? Well, my dad was a newspaper man by day, uh, advertising manager, but he was a magician by night. Oh, wow. And so as a kid, of course, it was magical. And my mother genuinely, unfortunately, I didn't learn from her, but uh, she was one of the best cooks and bread makers I've ever come across. So our cake tins in the house were always packed with goodies. And my dad always did his magic around the house. So my friends, children would love to come to our house because they had a magic show and they were fed with all this lovely cake and buns and everything. Things like butterfly kisses, my mum called them, and, you know, beautiful fairy cakes. So lovely. Amazing. And I imagine, from you saying that, did did that move you? Because you started early. You started at the age of seven, Seven. wasn't it? And you were a singer. Well, a lot of people don't know that you were a singer beforehand, yes. professionally, at the age of seven. Yes, and well, it was semi, so semi-professional then because I was still going to school. But in those days, and I hate to admit it, it was pre-television days, so there were no televisions. And so homespun entertainment was really big business. And because my dad was a part-time magician, um, I loved going to the concerts. And there were two girls who used to come from Belfast, and they used to wear these wonderful rainbow net dresses and they got paid 10 shillings between them you know for for entertaining which then was a fortune and I thought I'd like to do that one day so there was always a lull in the summer when there weren't any concerts people away on holidays and my dad said one year would you like to go to Miss Sheridan who was the pianist and I did learn a couple of songs and then I started singing when I was seven but you know we were north and south of the border and um you know, some nights we wouldn't have been home until one, half past one, and yet I was still up for school at seven in the morning and off to school. Wow. But that's just the way I grew up. And my mum, bless her, would sit up and wait for us coming home. And she'd have tea and sandwiches, getting me ready for bed, you know, for getting in pyjamas. And uh, so they were beautiful parents. Interesting. And, of course, it's only when you're older you look back and think how interesting they were and appreciate it. Um, but they were very caring parents. And my dad left school as people did then when he was like 13 stroke 14 but he could do anything 
and it's not me looking at it through rosy glasses. Mm. He could paint pictures. He could um, write poetry. He could help me with my essays many, many times for school. He was a magician. You know, he was a great advert man. I mean, these days, one of my grandsons is in the advertising business. They do it all, of course, by computer. But in my dad's time, he used to draw out by hand maybe five different ads, do the words, do the drawing, take it to the company and say, which of these do you like, and then price it. So, I mean, the effort that went into that was amazing. I think even be, for me, magicians have to be a kind of level of, um, create, have to have this kind of intense creativity anyway. They do. They and, have to have imagination, and well, as exactly. you say, that creativity. And even more so back then, I guess, when there weren't things like, TVs and stuff where magicians probably weren't seen as much. I mean, I don't think they're massively seen today, but obviously people know about them and have more access to In the Paul Daniels days, of course, they yeah. were on every Saturday night. So yeah, of course. It tends to, magic tends to go through phases, but because, as you rightly say, there was no television, um, ours was a concert party, so it was called the Middlester Variety Group. So you would have had, my dad, of course, you'd have had comedians, you'd have had singers, you would have dancers, you would have accordion players. And, and also you would have a bit of classical music as well. So it was a bit of everything. And it would have been held in schools or community halls or churches. And we called them daffodil teas because in the spring when the daffodils were out, the ladies of the church would lay out these big, long trestle tables and they would have daffodils all down the tables and then they would serve you food. And then in the winter, they'd be called meat teas because it would be winter time. Yeah. And Sometimes you could see the ham, or sorry, the, the pattern on the plate through the ham, it was so thin. Uh, but it was one of those, you know, local community efforts, which was very highly regarded. And of course, I've been making money since I was seven. I think the first salary I got was 10 and sixpence, an old money. And it was, I passed the hat round because that was my first, wow. my first night. So it made me very independent, maybe stupidly independent sometimes. It made me a conscious of money. It, made, it gave me a very strong work ethic because I've been working since I was seven, one way or another. Mm. It made me say the independent thing, well, like for example, if I said to my mum, oh, can I have like new socks or new sandals for Easter? Uh, she would go, no, 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 you have to wait for a couple of weeks. I can't afford it. So with a toss of the head, which you must have hated, I would say, well, then I'll just buy them myself <laughs> because I was making money. Yeah, of course. So that's why I think that I've always worked. Northern Ireland work ethic anyway is very strong. I mean, the uh, strike record in Northern Ireland is brilliant. Uh, people are good workers. They're strong workers. I and think that, I think that is still today. Like, I, I do. I, I'm I think basing that. this. One of my best friends is, is yes. from Northern Ireland, and she is completely work, 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 yes. and loves it. And has has had a baby, but want, wanted to go back to work. Yes. Uh, I know we were talking about it on the show today on Loose Women about women going to work and, and not. But I know that she definitely wanted to go back for, for herself. Yes. It was kind of ingrained in her. Yes. I wanted to go back as well, that, that past the hat round, because that must have been a huge thing when you were seven, because I've done stand-up gigs before, you know, like warm-up gigs before you do shows, and you go and do a preview, for example, for free, and at the end, there's a bucket at the end of the door. <laughs> and because you're not getting a fee for it because it's a free thing. But actually, there, what I remember the first time that happened and I got a few hundred pounds in this bucket. That's good. I know, yeah. But I was thinking there was something about they weren't obliged to give it and that it was that much money as like opposed to going... Yeah, exactly. And I imagine at that age, passing a hat round and receiving this wage, whatever it was. Well, of course, I would have been you know, that little, I mean, I'm still very short, I'm only five, five foot two, everybody in the programme is taller than I am. But perfectly um, formed. Oh, it. thank you. <laughs> um, but in those days, I would have been this little seven-year-old girl. My Aunt Myrtle was a wonderful dressmaker. She could have been haute couture in Paris if she wanted to, she was great. But she kind of dressed me, so I would have been in my yellow taffeta dress with little sequins around the neck or whatever. And I think people, there was a bit of the all oh, factor, yeah, you know, course. give her something there in the hat. <laughs> but, but, you know, again, a lot of people say, well, what did it teach you, you know, starting to entertain at that age? But, of course, it teaches you to stand up in front of people and do something. It teaches you to get used to the sound of your own voice, introducing your little songs, part of your face with sunshine, or A, you're adorable, B, you're so beautiful in those days. Um, but it, it subconsciously taught me a lot. It's only when a journalist maybe will say, 
So what did you learn from that period? Because I know people who could broadcast to, you know, 12 million people on television, but could not face an audience of a thousand people. But that has never bothered me because I've been used to live audiences all my life, really. And I think that's what it taught me. Well, I, I do notice that as well, because working with you on Loose Women and when, you know, we do the audience beforehand, you're always chatting to them and you do get involved. And actually, I notice when you're on the show as well, you kind of don't just talk to the ladies, you're talking to the audience, not just in the studio, but also at home. Um, and I do agree with you in that sense that there is that live, I mean, fortunately you can do both and you have done both. You can transmit and talk to 12 million, million people watching, but also from your background in theatre. How, how did that evolve into broadcasting? Well, as I mentioned, I started to sing when I was seven. Mm. And then, um, when I was 13, 14, these big handsome American men came to our town in black silks. I'm listening. And big hats. <laughs> and uh, they, of course, were uh, evangelists. And they were American Christian evangelists. And so they came to, not actually the church I went to, they came to a Methodist church in town. Tell a lie, it was a Presbyterian church. And um, we were so entranced, I think, by these men. We'd never seen people like that, really. You know, in their fabulous, as I say, black silk suits and hats and so on. And so I, along with a lot of my friends, were technically saved, okay? So it means you accept God into your life. And, you know. So when I went home to my parents, I, I was elated about the whole thing. They were so charismatic in their speech and how they talked to you. And I said to my dad, so I'm not singing anymore. And he said, no, why, why would that be? And I went, because I've been saved tonight. And I regarded that as a bit of a sin that I'd be out singing popular songs. And so I remember my dad saying to me, well, he said, do you not think that God gave you a voice to sing? I said, it doesn't matter. I've been saved and this is my path from here on in. Right. Well, of course, within weeks or months, I realized that although my friends wouldn't go to the cinema, to the pictures, we called it, uh, in Portadown, but they would go in Belfast. And then I, I began to realize the double standard. So eventually that eased off, of course. Um, but I mean, it's still, I still have a very strong belief. You know, I don't go to church every Sunday or anything, but... It did leave me with a very strong belief. So that was sort of like 14, around that age 14. And then when I was um, 17, I was desperate to go to Canada, desperate. And I'd gone back to singing, of course, then after I'd sorted my religious aspects out. Um, and I went to a place called Kingston, Ontario, in Canada. And I had a great uncle who lived there. And I also had a friend, it wasn't a boyfriend, he was just a friend. And he had become a mighty in Canada. And it was so glamorous. He would send me pictures of him on the horse in that wonderful uniform. And I was desperate to go to Canada, so I went there for a year. And of course, in Canada, whereas back at home in Port Island, there was only the BBC, there was no television. Um, in, in Canada, there would have been 15 television stations and 20 radio stations. So because I could sing, um, I got this little radio show all to myself and started to do, uh, singing Irish songs. Mm. I learned Irish songs really quickly then because I didn't know that many when I went. And um, so it gave me a taste for radio and TV. And then when I got back home, cutting a long story short, um, I wasn't intending to go back to Canada, but my dad noticed that there was a job as a production secretary in Ulster Television, which had opened up in my absence, a commercial station. And so... I apply, I've always been a great believer in fate, and I said to myself, even at that age, if I get this job, I'm meant to stay in Ireland, and if I don't get it, I'll go back to Canada. So I got the job. But you may be surprised, because you've been in television, you know, a lot, a lot of your life. But in those days, a production assistant would have been behind the scenes calling shots, looking particularly at the timing of the program. And there were no recording machines then. Everything was live. Oh, Every right. single thing. So as a production assistant, you would have your signature music on a reader to reel um, Then you would have your captions, which are gray pieces of cardboard, the caption pullers, it was all very elementary. But you would do a fashion program in the afternoon, then you'd race upstairs, and then you had to do the live news. So I've been used to live stuff all yeah. my life. And then when um, I met my husband, my first husband, Don, he was a television producer director. And um, when I married him, we, in those days, the rule was that you weren't allowed to work in the same departments. For example, he was on camera. So if a director had said to me, oh, you stupid son, so why did you get that time wrong? It would have been aggravating to him on cans because he would have heard that. 
So I, I had to leave because obviously he was going to be the main breadwinner. Um, and then I went back to singing on TV. And the reason, long answer to your question, the reason I got into broadcasting was I went to BBC in Northern Ireland uh, on a radio program, the equivalent of the Today program, Radio 4, uh, about a record that I'd made that had gone into the charts in Northern Ireland. That had meant very little. But it got, it got a lot of publicity. And it was a song, actually, that Lulu had performed for the Eurovision, a song called Are You Ready for Love? And um, so he said to me things like, how are you going to manage to do with children and this new pop career, etc." So the next day, he rang me up and he said, have you ever thought about broadcasting? Which I never had. I was going to be a singer. That was my life. And, and I was a busy singer at that time, doing cabaret and so on. And I'd never thought of it, but he gave me a job in broadcasting. And I loved the broadcasting side so much that I eventually... I was still singing, though, when I came over to England because I would have been on the Des O'Connor show and Val Dunigan's show yeah. and things like that because although I was doing Radio 2 at the time in England and from London, um, people didn't know I had ever been a singer, so therefore it was a bit of a novelty. But eventually... You know, you've got to keep practicing if you're singing. And uh, I really enjoyed the broadcasting more. But how lucky was I to be given a job? I know. And in those days, there were practically no women, either in front or behind a camera. But um, this radio producer, he wanted a woman. He was very forward-looking. And he wanted a girl on his team. So he gave me the job. But the very, very first day I went in, because I was nervous, because it wasn't something I'd planned. And he took me in, and it was out of time, 1969, so it was all bombs, bullets, and barricades in Northern Ireland. And he took me to the newsroom, which, of course, was a hot place. And he said, what do you see? And I went, well, I see a lot of men on typewriters that were pounding away. And he said, well, remember, and this is where his futuristic outlook was marvellous. He said, remember, you're not a woman coming in here to do knitting and sewing and recipes. You are as good as any bloke sitting behind any of these typewriters and you'll be out on the street doing bombs and bullets the same as them. So remember, you're as good as any bloke. Amazing. So without ever having had to think about it, he, I never had a problem with sexism. No, and, and you proved him right because you've had an amazing career. And you spoke about becoming a, a, applying to be a production secretary, which I, I know when you described it back then, Back here, um, nowadays, production secretary is very different. Um, but w what I wanted to bring up is uh, our previous production secretary on this show, on, on Loose Women, uh, Mitch, as you'll remember, lovely Mitch. I remember him saying to me one day, he said, oh, I've just had a, I've just had a really long chat with Gloria. And he <laughs> went, oh, she's such a legend. She's, <laughs> she's interviewed the best people ever and she's got the best stories and when I started this podcast I was thinking I have to ask Gloria about some of the amazing people that you've met and you've interviewed over the years. Who are some of the highlights? Well the thing is that when you're in Northern Ireland in a small area um, you get the visiting firemen we would call them so you might have got occasionally Elton John in to do a show or Rod Stewart, but mm. it was very spasmodic. So when I came to England, I could not believe it, because you've got to remember, again, luck. I mean, I say that I've been so lucky, I've been given the jobs and that, but you've got to make your luck work for you, and you've got to work hard behind the scenes. But um, I was given a, a programme called uh, Sunday Sunday, mm -hmm. actually, out of, out of London Weekend Television. And I don't know how they got the names, but they were the best, best Hollywood names ever. And of course, because I went to the cinema so much when I was young, I couldn't believe that I was about to interview, you know, Charlton Heston and Jimmy Stewart and mm. uh, June Allison and Doris Day and, and Audrey Hepburn and Leslie Caron. And I couldn't believe that they were there, but how exciting. And if I could live one part of my life again, that's what I'd like to do, because I was very new and quite naive, really, when I came over from Northern Ireland about how you would get big names like that. But... I would relive that if I could, but I am going to relive it in a different way because I'm putting together a one-woman show talking about Hollywood men and Hollywood women. Oh, amazing. Because I have got lots of lovely little stories, you know, um, about these people. Like, I mean, for example, Charlton Heston was married to his wife for oh, well, 60 years, I think, at that point. And I said to him in an interview, to his wife, actually, he brought his wife on one occasion, and I said, you know, in Hollywood, I said, 
you know, divorce is so prevalent. I said, have you ever thought about divorce? She said, divorce, never. Murder, often. <laughs> but, you know, little gems like that. Yeah. And so I feel very fortunate to have done that, very lucky. And, of course, Audrey Hepburn, I mean, Breakfast at Tiffany's is my all-time favorite film. And uh, to interview her was amazing. It actually was a relatively short time before she died. Um, but she still had that wonderful swan-like neck. And she just looked so elegant and so slim. And I regarded it as a real treat to do that. And then Leslie Caron, I spelled my daughter Karen's name after Leslie Caron. Yeah. It comes to C-A-R-O-N. And um, the first time I, I did quite a number of the Royal Variety shows. And all, because there's so many people backstage, the men are all in one room, the women all in another. And uh, I went up to the door to see who was in the room. And there was Lulu and Scylla Black. And there was Leslie Caron. I thought, oh, my God. But when I went into the room, uh, you know, having fantasized about the film Gigi and calling my daughter, you know, Karen, um, there she was sitting in her vest with no makeup. And I thought, this is not the way I wanted to see her. But she was very nice. And we ended up, actually, um, she said to me after the show, do you have a car going to the after show party? I said, I do. She said, would you mind if I come with you? So we oh, ended wow. up giving her a lift. So those are the experiences, you know, yeah. that, all these big names, but it, it wasn't down to me. It was a great researchers and great producers who got them. Of course, and I, I guess nowadays it's harder <clears throat> and harder with people's yes, PR and yeah, everything. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned Karen there, and you speak about Karen a lot. I do. Rightly so. Um, and you set up the Karen Keating Foundation, am I, am I, I did. Uh, to lose a child, and I'm certainly not undermining any other loss. I mean, I've lost parents, I've lost the first husband who had a heart attack. Um, but losing a child is like nothing other. No. And that's not to undermine anybody else's loss, because loss is very relevant to the person. But to lose a child is the most devastating thing that can ever happen to you as a parent. Um, I, Karen, as you may know, because she was a very well-loved Blue Peter presenter. Yeah. And she was a very, by society, she was a very, very special girl. She was very different. Um, and she and I, we were very, very close, and she and I would talk over things, and if I ever have a problem, I talk to Karen. She always had a different slant on things. She would say, well, have you thought about looking at it this way? And apart from her being my daughter, I loved her company. She was the woman I loved talking to most in life. She was amazing. And I have a little phrase that people never die if they live on the lips of the living. And I'll repeat that phrase because it's very important. People never die if they live on the lips of the living. So we set up a foundation in Karen's name which helps cancer charities of all types all over the country. And that really is my healing. Yeah. Um, and I think it's very good for you. Two, two beautiful boys, Charlie and Gabriel. Charlie was te um, 10 when she died, and Gabriel was 7. And so at a very vulnerable age, and they are fabulous boys. And Charlie's now 25, and Gabriel is 6 foot 5, and he's 22. And he was a tiny little mite when Karen died, like a little rabbit caught in the headlines. And they're... It's been wonderful for me to live long enough to see them. Yeah. I saw them being born, actually, because Karen asked me to go to the births, which is a wonderful privilege for any parent. And um, to have seen them being born and to see them now grow up into fine young men and have been, been through university and working, you know, it's a real blessing. I bet. And I actually, I've seen them uh, because we bumped into each other uh, at the Trick Awards. I don't we know if you did. remember, in, in December. <laughs> And I managed, one of my best friends had an invite because she's in the show that was nominated. So she said, that, the life of a freelancer basically means I get a lot of the plus ones, but I'm not complaining because no. I'm, I'm always available. And, uh, and I turned up, didn't really know what was happening. For anyone who just doesn't know listening, the Trick Awards is the uh, television and radio industry, industry club. Yeah. And uh, they put on this Christmas dinner and I arrived and in the, kind of the middle of the room, top table was, was yourself. Your grandsons, who else? Who else? And my husband. Your husband. My two sons, Michael yeah, yeah. and Paul, and his wife, Lisa. So it was a whole family turnout. And you were awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award at the Trick Awards. Yes. Now, it, it, it was such a thrill uh, because I, I knew that something might be happening because they had said, invite the family. They don't normally say to invite, invite <laughs> yes. the husband. But not you saw the, the table, family. you thought, hmm. Yeah, I wonder what's going on here. But it was a really wonderful surprise. And uh, Nick Ferrari, he's an LBC broadcaster and a great friend of ours, he made the speech. And he made an amazing speech, yes, I remember. Yes, he did. It's very flattering, of course, you know. 
taught him how to write it. <laughs> and he did a lovely speech. And of course, to be recognised by your peers is, you know, wonderful. And I was the first a female president of Trick um, when I first started Radio Two because my boss at BBC was the boss, and so I became the first female president. And so it's sort of like going in the circle, really. And I think my first award was in in the eighties because I remember I have a photograph at home with Terry uh, with the Trick Award. He must have presented it or something. So, you know, people who don't get awards, um, they say, oh. They don't mean anything anyway, but trust me, they do. Yeah. So I think it's uh, if people don't get a word to say they're not worth anything. They are. You love being recognised by your peers. And I, I, the whole room, I was stood there, and I, cause I, I don't obviously know you that well, but I know you, and I was like some sort of proud. I was like, <laughs> oh, and I was I like looking around going, yeah, I was. I was okay. I work with her. I work with her, everyone. But everyone, you did just a lovely speech. And uh, you were so gratuitous about it. I thought it was lovely. And very quickly, I wanted to talk about because it's a huge show now. You've had a um, huge career of stuff, but I did want to talk about because it's something different. And I don't think I ever watched it when you were back on it. But Strictly Come Dancing, I oh, when I was yes, looking I into, I didn't, know, to vote for me. I, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't know you did it. Well, I, I did it about a year and a bit after Karen died and I didn't want to do it at all. I could, But in my family, I couldn't find anybody to tell me not to do it mm. because I just thought I'm not strong enough to do it. You know, I, I can't, I could dance actually uh, because they used to teach us dancing at, uh, at my school in Porto Dan, ballroom dancing at Times. Right. So I wasn't afraid of that side of it, but I just didn't feel strong enough. Uh, but all my family thought it would be very good for me and it was because it gave me a reason to smile and to laugh mm. because when you lose a child, you feel as if you will never laugh again or find anything funny. Anyway, Strictly was great. My partner was Darren Bennett, who was only 28. And of course, um, the, one of the judges used to say, enjoy the fact that he's 28. And I'd go, for goodness sake, my husband and my grandchildren would say, silly old bat. I used to say to Darren, I can't do all that rumba stuff, you know, running my hands down your body you know can't do that <laughs> they don't think I'm absolutely nuts but it was a great release and it's great fun and you make friends forever um you really do and James Martin the chef I think he came second that year he was in it and we used to have some great conversations about his organic carrots that he grew in the field behind where he lived where he lived and you just make good friends and it was innocent in those days you know yeah the idea then say. was you would take a raw person and they if they could put one foot past the other, you were on. So I think I lasted three or four weeks, which was about the right time for the older. I was the older person mm. on that year. It was fantastic fun. It's, it's all become a bit controversial now. Yeah, it? It, it has changed somewhat. I was going to say, if you hadn't done it and the opportunity came now where you are mindset-wise, would you... With my dodgy you... knee, I don't think so. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, can, I would advise anybody to do it if they have a mind to do it because... It's like, it's like nothing else you'll ever do. It's your reality. Should, like, I would never do the jungle. No. Because I know I couldn't do all of that. I wouldn't want to. I'm allergic to mosquitoes. I don't want to sleep on the ground. I wouldn't like snakes or rats. I wouldn't do, couldn't do it. But Strictly Come Dancing is, is almost like the perfect reality show. Because they make you up. They do your hair. They dress you. It's not particularly dresses. dangerous. No. And, uh, but what I do always say to anybody, put the time in. Because when I did it, because it was, I think it was the second series, you know, I was promoting a book, doing a daily radio show, rehearsing for 20 minutes here and 15 minutes there on a BBC cupboard or something. And you have to give the time. And those who put the time in do really well. Okay, so I wanted to then move on to final. I always ask every guest this, their mantra for life. My mantra for life. Well, uh, if you're looking for a single phrase, I'll give you a funny one in a minute. Um, I suppose on my my epitaph or stuff on my stone mm -hmm. would be she tried because I'm, I'm very fond of a challenge and I do try everything to the best of my ability it doesn't always work but I try um, my mother gave me though a great saying she said in life you should always buy a wonderful pair of shoes and a really comfortable bed because if you're not in one, you're in the other. <laughs> yes, I like that. So these days, I stick to that routine. I definitely have comfy shoes and I definitely have a comfortable bed. So I guess I'll stick to that mantra. Gloria Honeyford, 
OBE, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Liz. I'm you've done this. Oh, it's very kind. Thank you for being such a lovely part of our Liz Wooden team as well. It's a pleasure. We love you. Thank you, Gloria. Thanks a lot, Liz.